Okay, Tim Ray, you can hear me okay? Yes, we can, Shane. Yeah. Excellent, yeah. excellent. Okay, well, we'll get started here. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all those people joining our webinar today. Uh, my name's Shane Cooper. I'm one of the sales leaders at Fortra. Uh, I'm joined by two of our very senior technical specialists, Tim Shaw and Ray Sutton, uh, who are going to present uh, at different times throughout the webinar. We're going to spend the next 40 minutes focusing on boosting your cloud security with MFT, and MFT being Managed File Transfer Technology or, or Capabilities. I'll hand it over now to Tim and we can get started. Thanks, Tim. Okay, thanks, Shane. Yeah, so <clears throat> what we're going to have a look at here after Shane's brief introduction, let's first of all, just address this situation of uh, the different installation mechanisms and operating system support that we we have within Go Anywhere at the various platforms that we've got. So what's becoming popular these days, of course, is the, the cloud capability. So we call that MFT as a service. Really, it's a platform, and Ray's going to talk about this more uh, shortly. But they, from a basic perspective, we manage the platform as in Fortra, but you manage the product itself, which deals with um, your workflows and all the goodness there and authentication mechanisms and so on. But of course, Go Anywhere can be installed on premises still, or even in your own virtual private cloud. And leading on to that, as you can see on the right hand side there, we're just outlining the various platforms that we are supported on. So, uh, Amazon, AWS, we're in the partner network. Um, Azure, of course, with the, the Microsoft uh, Cloud offering, Google Cloud, Windows Platform, Unix, Linux. We even have a containerized version of Go Anywhere as well. So, you know, that's running on, on Docker. So, from that perspective, we are covered on a number of platforms. And how do we achieve that? Well, the fact is that go anywhere is a java application so really any platform that supports the appropriate version of the java virtual machine you should be able to install and run uh, go anywhere on next slide please right what we want to talk about here is the various mft architecture options as you can see so if we started at the left hand side we've got just a single mft now some customers do want that that's all they want just an offering of a sf either an sftp service or potentially just running some workflows more typically what we find is that we uh, get customers and prospects that want the single mft capability because they that's the services they want to offer or they want to write their own workflows but going through an with the external database, because that's very important when you're moving into a production environment, we do support the Derby database as an embedded database, but that's really only good for uh, proof of concept types of production. You really need to have a, an external database, and we support the popular ones, Oracle, MySQL, uh, Microsoft SQL Server. Just dropping below the line for a second there, that again, what from an architectural perspective, what we find a lot of customers do want to do is they can have a combined environment where they've got production and their non-production, i.e. development environments, all running through a single instance of Go Anywhere. But Sometimes that's not good enough, you know, because with it being non-production, people like to reboot systems and servers and services, stop and start, which of course, if it's a production environment, it's not really good. So having separate environments, of course, gives you that uh, availability that most in organizations do want, which moves us again, going back up above the line there, into multiple MFT servers. And so what we can have here is we've got production environments, non-production environments, and even um, multiple production environments. If you've got a large, you know, large amount of traffic coming through, then what you would want to be building is a clustered environment. 
and to assist in having a, a robust clustered environment, then typically what customers are going to do is be using the Go Anywhere Gateway product to front end and manage the traffic between um, your external users coming in and which uh, MFT node you know, they are actually going to connect to. And in some situations, of course, we do have customers who've gone for multiple gateways as well. But in that sort of situation, what you need to be doing is front-ending your gateways with a load balancer itself. So that's the sort of uh, environment that the customer can provide a load balancer, but you've got multiple gateways for real high availability and, of course, redundancy. And then at the back end, you're going to have a clustered environment. And of course, that then leads us into your DR environment as well. So again, many choices here from an architectural perspective. You can have um, what you might call a warm DR environment, whereby when the database, is, you or you configured your database environment to do log shipping into your DR environment, so you can bring the environment up really quickly, or you could just go with a cold type environment where you've got go anywhere installed, it's not running, but you're actually doing copies of your entire database on a, a regular basis or perhaps a nightly basis. So that covers the installation options and the architectural options. And what we'll do now, I'll hand over to Ray, who will now talk about the different um, you know, support considerations. Thank, thank you, Tim. Um, yes, so basically with for deployment or a support perspective, there is various methods that we can deploy for Go Anywhere. So obviously a common one would be an on-prem where it's all managed by you. You provide the VMs and the, and the systems and the operating systems and the stack all the way through to the managed and manage the whole environment from an MFT perspective. And you can have those clustered as Tim mentioned and those sort of things as well. Or more popular these days is us seeing going into your private cloud where you've got you know your AWS or Azure or Google Cloud or whatever you've got in, in your infrastructure um, and that's supplying you the VMs and, uh, for the system and then the virtualization and the operating system and all the way up to the user management is then um, controlled by you as well. So that could also be in a private cloud methodology where you might have a, a sorry, public cloud methodology where you might have a contract with, with, with one of those cloud providers um, to provide you those um, server capabilities and management capabilities. And lastly, we can manage it for you. So for our managed file transfer as a service, it, it's more akin in the cloud speak as to um, a platform as a service rather than a full SaaS model. So basically, Fortran will provide you with an instance or a, a, a system all the way up to the application level and will monitor and maintain that for you. And then basically, the data and the administration of the system is then controlled by you for your, for your Go Anywhere environment as well. So really what we're going to look at is how we can deploy your MFT into the cloud. What architecture considerations do you need to look at? As Tim mentioned, you know, we, we can connect to Amazon AWS, which for uh, RMFT as a service, that actually runs on AWS provided infrastructure. Um, we've obviously got on Microsoft Azure, which is also very popular with our customers. And we are starting to see a lot more of the Google Cloud Platform as well, uh, certainly in the Asia Pacific region. But there's other cloud platforms such as Oracle, such as Alibaba, as, as, uh, as Tim mentioned, and Linode as well, if you're in that US type environment. And as I mentioned, the MFTAS is actually hosted by Fortran in that AWS environment. So sizing is obviously the next part, really. How do you size your solution? So I want to go back to what Tim was talking about earlier a little bit when he was talking about UAT development and production environment, where you're looking at how can I consistently build systems for each of those environments and your SDLC pipeline so that you can actually build those situation and, and solutions um, to, for those. Okay. So in the example, um, you, you really need to look at how you want to distribute your node. You need to understand your traffic. And I will be sort of put the caveat here that, to be honest, there's no two MFT systems that are the same. And they've all got very different environments. 
So it's really important to actually devise your platform um, in, in the right way. So in an example, as an example, um, in Go Anywhere, if you have advanced workflows, which is the main core part, core part of the MFT uh, that provides your automation, um, no two jobs really are the same. You, your, you design um, are going to be the same, but inside that advanced workflow engine, there's 150 tasks. And those tasks may need more memory than more resources than other. So that's why having the ability to build in a sandbox environment like a development and then pushing that release through to a UAT and then to production um, is, is a good way of doing it. And you can also have a look at how you might want to do a new release of software where you can test the upgrade and solution prior to making those changes to your production environment. And again, it ensures that consistency and robust release management strategy as well for your IT cloud technology. Now you need to make sure, do I have enough vertical resources to handle this new load, or do I need to scale horizontally and have more, more on or, or two more additional nodes in Go Anywhere? As Tim mentioned, again, you can cluster Go Anywhere. So these are the sort of questions you need to ask yourself from a production to make sure it's sized properly. We consistently hear from customers who advise that any impact to my production environment will cost us thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars every hour. So making sure you're investing in their environment in the front end is, is really, really, really important. So I also would like to advise that some of the size and information shown on this slide is really more of a starting point. And we would highly recommend that any changes or updates from these figures are really just the ballpark figures. So these are based on some stress testing that we've done. But as we noted earlier, no two environments are the same. And um, being able, we can't really cookie cut this way for, for those. So what you can see here though, is some small, medium and enterprise sizing guidelines. And these are really the markers that you can go off, for example, transferring or receiving files, or perhaps doing encryption and data translations. That may be more memory intensive. So you need to have more memory on those. And obviously the file size will also be a factor on how you might also size up your environment. So being able to deploy to like the small to medium and enterprise ones, as you can see here, um, what this is showing you on here is really what we look at when we're provisioning nodes. So, so you can see, go back again to Tim's slide, where we said a small to medium type deployment size is really two medium EC2, T3 instances in, in Azure, in Amazon, I beg your pardon. And then you can see the ones for the different ones in the Azure uh, provision in here. And on the storage side, um, the elastic file system type storage, general purpose, performance mode, and bursting through. And you can see also the IOPS there for small to medium, and likewise for enterprises. So we do also have our architecture guide available on our website, and we can provide a link to that. So but just really to show you how we would look at putting things in place for our solutions. Um, as you can see, they're clustered environments in the majority of cases where we've got two nodes. Um, and of course, it's just then the performance indicators for those. So let's just talk about um, our NFT as a service in a bit more detail here. So we have three tiers available. A tier one is a single gateway, single MFT. A tier two is a single gateway with a dual MFT or a clustered MFT, if you want to look at it that way. And tier three is a single gateway with a dual MFT, but obviously with bigger storage and bigger RAM and bigger, bigger infrastructure in itself. So the idea really um, for our service offering is that we want to be able to offer as broad a range of tools in our cloud. But if there's a caveat to this though, I would just say that if you are an enterprise customer who are transferring say millions of files or thousands of files, or have, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> um, it has very high resource rates. <clears throat> sorry, MF tags cannot currently scale to that type of transferability. <clears throat> sorry, I'm really sorry. So we recommend that you host this on your cloud, where if required, you can throw more compute at this or to ensure that production readiness. Tier three can put out a fair bit, somewhere between five to 7,000 five 
7,500 transfers concurrently, but it just won't scale to that million or, or, or those really high numbers that you might need. So, and just remember that all transfers are not created equally, so you do need to be tested to ensure that they can manage your environment. So our MFTAS really is designed if you don't have the resources, the capability or the IT capability in-house, we can run your environment based on those MFTAS markers we showed earlier. And then MFTAS is a great solution for you. We handle the upgrades, the patching, the taking care of your infrastructure and providing that surety of solution, which is important to you. So let's have a look at the pros and cons, but it's quite funny really when you look at some of these uh, pros and cons, because some of the cons can also be a pro as well. For example, that first point there around the data where it could be quite costly. Well, you know, if you look at Amazon S3 or blob storage, you know, these provide heavy rewrite and long-term storage, that's reasonably priced. So that could also be a benefit as well as a, as a con. But looking at the pros for a moment, you can see some real benefits like scalability, agility, taking some of that infrastructure headache from your IT support personnel. But I think one big pro that's really overlooked, and Tim mentioned it as well, is the business continuity or disaster recovery benefits. Thinking about, you know, if you were to put this in your environment, you would probably have to stand up another data center. It may have to be in another state or even in a different country. And that's a huge um, problem, you know, where you may not have that capability or resource. So by using that flexibility that you get in the cloud infrastructure that provides that kind of DR or business continuity benefit is, is a real pro, in my opinion. So when those natural disasters happen, having the ability to pivot across to another environment is a huge benefit of moving to the cloud. So it really provides that less stressful environment with no real need to maintain the DR scenarios for your company. On the cons, support team lack of knowledge, you know, so large deployments sometimes can be problematic when the support team doesn't know your environment in the cloud solution. And it, that could lead to a longer outage time due to the lack of knowledge on your apps, which may be running on that cloud platform. I think it depends on how important this deployment and how available does the system need to be. If you are a 24 by 7 by 365, then perhaps it's not really a way for us to manage your resources. And we probably would recommend that you would deploy on-prem or in your own private cloud. Now I'm gonna pass back to Tim for the next few slides. Thanks, Ray. So what we want to have a look at here is, as you can see, cloud security best practices. I'm not going to read through every point here. I'm going to actually just call out uh, a, few, a couple of the points on the, this slide and the next slide as well, just to raise awareness of what we're putting across as the best practices. So for example, uh, if we look at point one, virtual networking within the cloud environment, you know, whether you're on AWS, Azure, Google, they all do provide a networking capability, of course, and some of them are potentially better than others and you've got this private cloud capability but it, what you've got to be looking at is designing your network topology and architecture perhaps from a zero trust standpoint as well so what we mean by that is only allowing data to flow that is required to flow so that of course means um, bringing in things such as your firewalls and so on firewall rules and restricting what can what can go where. And also, that comes down to, from a security perspective, if you're running on VMs, which you probably would be with um, a Go Anywhere, is restricting service endpoints as well on the VMs that you are actually executing. You know, so it does mean that your security team and your still need an infrastructure team to uh, manage your environment. If we looked at, Point two as well. What we're trying to uh, point to look at here is restricting lateral movement. You want to stop people if you do get some adversary that breaks into your system. This is one of the most common breaking uh, environments. They find a, 
uh, the low hanging fruit, so to speak, break into your system. And from there, we've got privilege escalation and we can hop across to other systems. You want to stop that. You want to stop that lateral movement. How are you going to do that? Move towards, again, a zero trust environment. And so what would that entail in a cloud type environment, of course, is implementing things such as uh, multi-factor authentication. So that if a user gets on one system, if they want to move to another system or even run an application on another system through a, a web browser, for example, or even a desktop application, they should have to authenticate to that environment. And in fact, even um, you know, some government, governments these days, regulations, or certainly here in Australia, we have what's called the essential aid. That's one of the mandated aspects of that, that you have, A, you've got multi-factor authentication, but also you don't directly connect to servers if you're going to administer them. So if you do get administrative privileges, you can't just hop across to another system uh, directly. You have to go through what you would call a jump host or a bastion type server. So you've got effectively that sort of air gapped capability. Just highlighting point three here as well. This one's, I guess, not necessarily so obvious because these days people do just install software and expect it to run. They go from test environments as in proof of concept straight into production and they may have insecure protocols enabled. So what you need to do here is look at what protocols you've actually got enabled and only have secure capability or secure endpoints enabled. So what do we mean by that? Well, if you're running a web server, for example, then, or a web access, web service endpoint, for example, we go anywhere with um, the web client, you would only ensure, only ensure that you have the HTTPS service enabled for it. Don't create a listener that listens on port 80, because that, of course, is totally insecure. The same, so if that's from uh, user to business communication, where you've got a physical user coming in, and certainly system to system communications, again, very common whereby people will use scripting techniques to upload, download files. You want to disable older protocols such as FTP. If you still require FTP capability, then what you should be using is FTPS. So it's FTP obviously over SSL. Or perhaps if you can move to using uh, the SSH protocol. So that would be SFTP and SCP capability. So that's what we mean by that is implement secure end-to-end -end connections. So, you know, bottom line, it should run either over some protocol like SSH or use certificate type protocols, which of course would be implemented using SSL. Um, deployment of detection and response tools. You know, what organisations should be looking at here is uh, things such as web application firewalls or WAFs as we call them. So a WAF, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on, um, you know, where it can actually uh, work with you to examine the traffic that's coming in. So key point here, large amount of traffic that may be flowing and what you're going to have, if you've got a, a, running a large site, large number of users coming in, you're not always going to be able to see what's going on. So you do need to have tools available within your organization. So you know, if you're getting an attempted denial of service attack or something like that, that data is being managed somewhere and it's being visible somewhere. So, and this is where, a, a, for example, a security operations center would come into play because that's exactly the sort of functionality that they would uh, provide for you. Next slide, please, right? And so moving on, what do we want to look at here is regardless of the system type, whether it is on premises or in the cloud, you should have the same level of application controls for your applications and networking devices. And so it leads to the leads us back to what we were just talking about in terms of what rights and what privileges do users really need to be able to operate either their servers 
or the networking devices, you know. And we do know of, of things that have happened in the past where telecommunications providers have been broken into, you know, hacked because they've just installed networking equipment, left the default password there, and, and the bad guys have found it and broken into networks. Now, generally these days, of course, one would hope that that sort of attack isn't going to be as prevalent as it was, say, 15 or 20 years ago, but that's certainly what has happened. And central deployment of, of management and monitoring tools. So this leads in from what I was saying just before about uh, where you've got your firewall, it's generating a lot of data. If it's all on a local system, very rarely you will guarantee people are not going to log into that local system just to have a look at log files. You've got to have, uh, you know, seam security incident and event monitoring tools in place so that log data is going to some central location where you can further process it. And we know, you know, there are a number of other tools around on the market that allow you to do that. And so that, of course, is a very important aspect. Incident investigation and response solutions, you know, you need things like that in place. So that would come down to having a, you know, good security team and so on and people knowing what happens when you do get some uh, signal raised that you're that somebody's attempting to breach your environment. The last point I guess I wanted to just cover here was that point nine about support staff. That it's all very well to say, yeah, we're moving to the cloud and everybody can do everything. It's just like working on premises and so on. And people can go and read some books and whatever, but you really do need to ensure that your staff are well trained. You know, we have um, um, what do we call it? Infrastructure as code. So rather than an operator or you know system administrator logging into your cloud environment and clicking through to do an installation of software, typically you are using third-party tools that are very popular but also very powerful. And so you want to ensure that your staff are trained in their use, so that if they are using these infrastructure as code tools, they are not building systems in a an ad hoc fashion, you know, it is a well controlled fashion uh, that is building with security in mind from the ground up. So those are just the points we wanted to cover there when talking about the security aspects, you know, your cloud security best practices. So back to you, Ray. Thank you again, Tim. So when we talk about implementing Go Anywhere in a hybrid cloud environment, there might be a need for to put, for an example, an agent into your environment as well. As you can see um, on this schematic, just to explain the schematic here, what you can actually see is a cluster of Go Anywhere servers, a gateway uh, linking out from your uh, chosen cloud provider. Now we put the AWS banner on here because it's taken directly from our MFT as a service, but that could quite easily be Azure and it could also easily be GCP or any of the other cloud providers as well. So what's really the important though is when you're designing this solution, you understand where all your data points are. And as Tim mentioned about what services like authentication, how you're going to authenticate all these different people, whether they're coming from the internet or whether they're going into your own internal environments as well. And also what you might need to data, you might need to migrate into the cloud or from the cloud into those environments as well. So some data points, for example, network shares may have important information, which also needs to be available to your go anywhere environment. However, we do know that that's a potential security problem with, with certain, certain SMB and certainly with some parts of, of the network sharing infrastructure that's out there. So the idea that we have here is that we would recommend deploying an agent. So what you can see in this schematic is your internal network, which is showing two sites. You may have more, you may have less, and you may only have one. But you basically deploy an agent, which is then managed by the MFT in your environment. And on that agent, you connect your storage or your directory services or your file and application server repositories and so on. But it's all centrally managed still from your centralized go anywhere. Likewise, if you have, uh, I'd say, a number of cloud 
um, places where you've got storage as well, such as Azure Blob, as you can see in this Azure one at the bottom, or you've got data lakes, or you've got, you know, this standard file storage even in, in, in Azure as well. You can also deploy an agent there to again link up to those environments and to allow us to connect back to the Go Anywhere gateway. Um, this should be an arrow that goes from this agent to the gateway here, um, but for clarity, we, we, we move that. But effectively, the, the, the agent will connect again through the gateway through to the MFT servers. So these agents are a really important part of your capability, and they can be used everywhere as well. You know, the other use cases for perhaps some of the agents as well is if you've got badly performing network somewhere that you need, might need to put an agent in place. And again, it's to give you that fully secure managed infrastructure in your cloud. So everything between the go anywhere and the agent is encrypted in transit and everything that sits on the go anywhere and sits on the agent is encrypted at rest as well. So you can have a lot of different architecture, um, you know, which will meet your requirements. We've even got customers who flip this architecture a little bit where they've got their go anywhere on-prem and they actually go out and deploy agents into that cloud, into their cloud environments to allow again for that seamless integration of, of their, their, their systems. So uh, Go Anywhere has a lot of cloud connectors available and one of the pros of that is that these are really cost effective and they can link up to all sorts of different things. Now you can see on here the storage ones, you know, the Azure blobs, the data lakes, as uh, Tim mentioned, you know, Amazon S3 buckets, but there's also 39 other cloud connectors roughly. Um, and these provide either a storage or even a business enablement connector such as Salesforce, SharePoint, um, and they allow the create, deleting, download, exporting, list, move, renaming, and so on for all of those files. So what we can actually see with those capabilities is the ability to sort of move your um, go anywhere if you like from a cloud into a proper sort of business manager business end cases as well so just to explain the storage specifically around the s3 as well and other blob storage is that it uses what's called the ceph uh, ceph um, tool which is an open set open source software defined storage solution which was designed is designed to address the block storage or block file and object storage needs of modern enterprises. It is highly scalable, and we can see it looking as a new norm for those high growth block storage. So those things that we can connect to, it means that go anywhere can connect to because it's following a framework, this set framework. So that makes it a lot easier to use. Another option, as I say, is also for um, deploying an agent for your S3 buckets and your data lakes as well. So the cloud connectors, as I say, are a really important part. As I say, we've got them for things like SharePoint, OneDrive, Box, Dropbox, a lot of the storage type apps. And of course, then we've got the ones that go out to our business ones. The other cloud connectors offer the additional steps. Of then instead of connecting from an API, which is a common, which we might have done traditionally, we can use our cloud connectors to offer rest, put, get post and soap type commands. And with the easy to use workflow drop downs on our go anywhere system, we're able to uh, automate those tasks as well. So for things like MS Dynamics or Salesforce, we can create records or we can actually do some functionality with those. There's also a custom add on feature where you can build your own custom add-on or your own cloud connector for your own environment if you've got a RESTful API available. Um, all of those uh, cloud connectors can be installed from our marketplace that you can actually, which is installed inside, go anywhere. Now I say to be clear, it does need advanced workflows um, module for those to actually work as well. But you know you can do lots of things with them. There's one that actually goes to service now, so you could do automated fault ticketing or your support tickets um, to raise that ticket, or you might have a CSV file which has records in Salesforce that you need to update. So they're really flexible in the way that they work, and it's not it then moves on your MFT from not just a traditional file transfer, but some automated business functions that you might have as well. 
So this is just really showing some of the functions available for some different ones. So you've got the SharePoint online one, you can see here, a shortened list there of being able to connect to those. The next one is the Azure Data Lake, the Gen 2, I won't go through all of these, but you can see the different ones from there. But this end one here is the project designer. And what this is literally showing you is the ability to pick up one of these, say, for example, the download on this Google Drive connector, and you drag and drop that into your workflow. You then have to fill in, obviously, which, which Google Drive connector you're talking about, and then you can then upload that and put that into your workflows. So you can really automate your ability to connect and deliver files from any source. So, this slide's really talking about a vast array of documentation, both within the Go Anywhere app itself. So in Go Anywhere, what you'll see is question marks, normally in the top right hand corner of any page that you're looking at here, like the ones that's highlighted here for this AWS one. And that's context sensitive help. So it will click from there and will take you to a user guide, which has the context sensitivity to show you what page that relates to. Our actual um, user guide, sorry, our, our, our guide is actually around about four and a half thousand pages. So, which is also available on the Go Anywhere server as well. So you can actually you can download that. And of course you can download that as well if you need to. But you can see the kind of documentation that we have on our site here. And it's accessible from the my.goanywhere.com website. There's an architecture guide and hardening guide, obviously the installation guide, a comprehensive API guide. And there's others in there as well around like the web client, the agent that we've spoken about today, and the secure, and the secure mail one as well. So on that, I'm now going to hand back to Tim for his part. Thanks, Ray. What we want to have a look at now is integrating Go Anywhere with bundles that are from the Fortran stable. And the first one we want to have a look at is the you know, MFT with data loss prevention and threat protection. So this is implemented by utilizing our ClearSwift ICAP gateway or a secure ICAP gateway as we call it as well. Uh, ICAP is an industry standard protocol. It's one of the standard web protocols. So internet content adaptation protocol. In its early versions and, and traditionally where it's been used is literally a file comes into your organization, you send it off to um, an ICAP server, which will typically just scan for viruses in that data stream or data file and send a result back to your, um, whether it be a proxy or your file transfer environment. However, with the ClearSwift uh, integration product, so the ClearSwift ICAP gateway, what we have here is not only the threat protection, and we configure this in Go Anywhere as well, so it's fully automated. Data comes in, you configure it the AB option and tell it to communicate with your um, ICAP gateway. It will do the traditional function of an ICAP server in terms of just scanning for viruses, you know, malware, whatever is in your data. In addition to that, we can also incorporate data loss prevention. And what we mean by that is we've still got the automated capability for scanning um, uploaded files. We also have the ability to call the ICAP uh, gateway uh, from a project, so effectively for outbound data as well. With data loss prevention, what we can do is set up policies whereby we can provide patterns, for example, of uh, what does a credit card number look like? We want to take that data out of any file that is being transmitted. So whether, for example, it's a CSV file, we want to be able to examine that CSV data and remove personally identifiable information, such as credit card numbers, uh, potentially things like your tax file number, social security number, whatever, uh, sort of government issued identity numbers you may have. You don't want that data going out. And I guess the one that we typically forget is email addresses as well. You may not want email addresses going out in, uh, in text files that you're transmitting to and from your organization or receiving and transmitting. So you want to be able to remove that information. So that is a bundle that we have 
with Go Anywhere. So it's the threat protection bundle. And you know, organizations that we can see government regulated industries sometimes, well, they find this integration valuable because they're getting everything from the single vendor rather than having to, you know, go and think about, oh, well, I've got product X, does it support ICAP? Does it actually have all the functionality that you're getting through this one bundle from Fortran? Uh, next slide, please, Ray. Now, the, the second uh, add-on that we just want to discuss here is the Alert Logic web, web application firewall, in fact. So traditionally, of course, with uh, you know, web applications, somebody, uh, an external user will connect to your environment and it will be presented with a web page, you know, where to do their login and so on. And, and you know, that's what we have with Go Anywhere as well. You're going through a front end firewall from your organization and into the Go Anywhere gateway and the, thus you're then authenticating to the back end go anywhere, you know, NFT product. What we can do now is we can introduce the Alert Logic web application firewall, which basically is going to examine HTTPS traffic. SFTP, through the very nature of the way uh, SSH traffic actually works, uh, we just pass that straight through. But with HTTPS, we can act as the endpoint um, and then start to examine the data effectively the web application firewall is a really is a level seven firewall and what we mean by level seven is the old osi model of level seven being the application layer so the WAF itself can do a number of a number of things for us in terms of examining some of the data that's coming through we can also configure it to manage uh, the the amount of data that's coming through as well so to stop people sending uh, multi terabyte files, for example, which would be a great way of blocking up a system. If we wanted to attack somebody, we can just start uploading very large files and consuming all resources. So that's the sort of thing that can be configured. The key thing as well is that you're not out on your own if you've got the alert logic WAF. This is a managed web application firewall. So what that means is you've got effectively got a security operations center working for you. They will be uh, notified of any attempts to break into your environment or even if it's examining data and sees that um, malformed data in terms of connectivity information and request information coming through, if it's malformed and potentially looks like someone trying to exploit your environment, the Security Operations Center will be informed and then they will get in touch with you as the customer to decide how best to proceed in this sort of environment. So effectively, it is software as a service, and obviously it's a cloud-based add-on as well. So it works very nicely with uh, MFT as a service. So that's what I wanted to wrap up with just a couple of uh, points there. So back to you, Ray. Thanks again, Tim. So as Tim mentioned way back in the beginning as well, is obviously around this zero trust as well. So if you imagine our student uh, go anywhere, which is a very robust, very secure, as you could probably see on the cloud platforms, it's very secure. And we've got things like PGP encryption as well, so we can PGP encrypt the files. But what you've got to ask yourself, is that enough for your organization? Do you need to take that zero trust approach to file? protection. So in other words, really, it's more about the network segmentation, you know what I mean, and encrypting and securely sharing information, because then once that file, if you like, is after it's PGP'd, what happens then? You lose control of that. So the idea is around this zero trust is that it gives that, that control across the whole life cycle of that file. So with our Digital Guardian Secure Collaboration Transfer Bundle, what we can actually do is we can not only now scan for malware and viruses, as Tim mentioned, we can also do the, the uh, DLP capability, but we can now give you control after that file has, has been landed somewhere. So that wherever that file travels, that will be 
um, a file that you can track and monitor and maintain. You can revoke access to those files. You can change people's persistence levels, sorry, change people's levels of access to that. So you might give them access to maybe update a couple of lines in a document and then giving them a view only after that as well. So the idea is, is that we can really limit what you actually do across those environments as well. And another common limitation as well that people see when we're doing file transfer is that ability to send large files efficiently. You know, if we're using HTTPS, um, you know, that can take some time to deliver large files. Um, so things around you know, video footage and, and so on. So with the ability to have something that you can put levels of control and deliverability on files, you can actually then control how that file reaches there. Excuse me. So if using a file secure transfer is no longer enough, and even using encryption like PGP, which is all of that is a fantastic secure file transfer methodology and certainly one that we would recommend, but you, you still need more than that, then that's really where our zero trust comes in. So it's again, with our suite of tools, as you could probably see on here, is that we've got a lot of integration points within our own cybersecurity platforms that cover you for your cloud solutions, which leads me quite nicely onto the slide as well. So what you're looking at the screen here is, is Fortress cloud ready solutions for you? So it's a full cybersecurity suite of tools. Now we've been talking obviously about the secure file transfer and some of the other ones as well about the managed security, like the managed WAF and so on. And what you can see within this are the data protection, you know, and the data loss prevention and endpoint, those sort of things as well. So what you'll see here is that we've got a whole suite of tools. It's not just talking about one unique solution. Some, most of these are also cloud ready, so they fit inside that cloud model as well. Um, so they allow you to um, look at your system natively across the whole environment. On that, I am going to pass back to um, Shane to do the wrap up. Okay, thanks, Ray. Well, uh, I guess um, I trust everyone enjoyed the webinar today and, and certainly a special thanks to Ray and Tim for, for presenting and the content. Um, fair to say managed file transfer or secure data transfer is synonymous with security. If you're looking to increase your cloud security and ultimately protect your sensitive data, then please reach out and let us help. Thanks for your time and enjoy the day ahead. Thank you.